where I go. I'd like to uh, give you a, a somewhat different perspective tonight on a couple of different issues. One is that when we talk about water as a social justice issue, uh, one thing I, I hope you understand is that water is more than a water issue. We're, we're not talking simply about water affordability tonight, right? We are uh, talking about housing affordability. People who have unaffordable uh, water bills are losing their, their homes. People who get disconnected never get back into their homes. We're talking about family preservation. If you're interested in, uh, in keeping families together, you should be interested in affordable water. In Philadelphia, the number one reason that kids are removed from their homes from amongst the population that goes to community legal services is because of utility shutoffs. So keeping utility bills affordable helps keep families together. We're talking about an education issue. I did some work in Missouri, and we found that uh, people who have unaffordable uh, water and utility bills tend to move more frequently than, at lots more, it's not even close, but a lot more frequently than people who have affordable bills. But the problem is that when people move frequently, they yank their kids in and out of schools, and uh, when kids uh, change schools uh, a certain number of times, four times in the, uh, before fourth grade, they are more likely to be below grade in reading and mathematics. They're more likely to drop out of school. There are significant education uh, issues with unaffordable uh, utility bills, unaffordable water bills, and that, that, even, that doesn't even consider the impact on the teachers who have to figure out when a kid comes in in the middle of the school year how to, uh, what, what does that kid know and how does the student uh, get brought into the curriculum that the teacher is, uh, uh, is uh, teaching. Uh, it's an environmental compliance issue. It is, uh, and that's what I want to talk about in the context of Baltimore. There, I want to give an overview of the problem that I see in Baltimore. Sorry, I don't mean to break the presentation. I have to do something. Sorry, I have to do something. I would do it if I didn't have to. <laughs> Funny. So, uh, what I want to uh, what I want to do tonight is from two different perspectives: to look at the problem in Baltimore and then to uh, propose to you a solution because this is not an irresolvable problem. It's a problem that's eminently uh, fixable. The, one of the problems facing Baltimore is that Baltimore is under a federal mandate to clean up its water and sewer service. Uh, are, are people aware of that uh, generally? And the city of Baltimore has uh, committed to spend not millions, not hundreds of millions, but billions of dollars uh, in the next 10 to 20 years in uh, uh, furtherance of that uh, federal uh, consent decree. Uh, the problem is that unlike 30 years ago when cities were uh, ordered to clean up their water and wastewater, today there's no federal money to help pay for that cleanup. And so the cleanup occurs exclusively on the backs of ratepayers. And uh, uh, in a city like Baltimore, you can spend $3 billion and you can charge that $3 billion to your customers but your customers can't afford to pay it. And you can charge the money all you want, but if you're charging money to uh, customers who can't afford to pay, you're not translating the bill revenue into collected revenue. So, um, and, and that's the problem that Baltimore is facing. That's the problem that uh, the recent report that I did for Food and Water Watch uh, shows, that the bills have tripled in the last few years uh, however, the uh, uncollectible bills that, or the uncollectible accounts that uh, uh, Baltimore Water is facing have gone up by 1,400%. You can bill more and more revenue and collect uh, less and less of that. And while we originally talk 
about water as a social justice issue and as a housing issue and as a nutrition issue and as an education issue, what I would posit to you tonight is that unaffordable water is also a business issue from the perspective of the Baltimore Water Department. Because if the Baltimore Water Department doesn't figure out how to collect the money that it is billing, then it is simply not going to uh, be in the financial position to pay back the money that it's, it's borrowing to, uh, to clean up its water and wastewater uh, service. And I, I looked at um, the affordability of water on a, a pretty disaggregated basis uh, throughout. I broke up Baltimore into uh, uh, an almost, but not quite, 200 distinct uh, areas and found that uh, starting in 2017, going through 2022, an in, uh, uh, increasing number of those uh, areas within Baltimore were facing unaffordable water bills. And when I talk about unaffordable water bills, I'm talking about water and sewer and stormwater. I, I just can't say water, stormwater, uh, uh, sewer in every sentence. So whenever I say water, you should hear water, sewer, uh, stormwater. And Baltimore has a real financial problem that, uh, that it's facing beyond the social problem, beyond the social justice problem, beyond the housing and education problem. It's got a business problem uh, as a utility. Uh, the thing is that Baltimore isn't unique in facing this type of business problem. When the Federal Environmental Protection Agency enters into these consent decrees with local governments and with communities around the country, they, uh, they being the EPA, also uh, has a process uh, through which the, uh, the EPA considers the communities what they call the capacity to pay. And that, that's a term of art, the capacity to pay. And in the guidance that the EPA sent out to local governments in 2013 about uh, thinking about your capacity, to, your community's capacity to pay, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, wasn't neutral on whether low-income uh, customers should receive special discounted rates. The EPA and its guide, 2013 guidance specifically encouraged local governments to adopt low income, uh, affordable low income discount, discounted rates. And I'll tell you folks, the, the EPA has, has no interest in the social justice issues of affordable water. What the EPA is interested in is making sure that when Baltimore borrows $3 billion to clean up its water and sewer, uh, systems that Baltimore is capable of paying that $3 billion back. And EPA has uh, determined uh, and has endorsed the notion that, uh, as strange as it may seem, that you can't squeeze water out of a stone. That uh, uh, if uh, you charge customers $1,000 a year for their water bills and customers can only afford to pay $600, uh, you, you've got a problem. And it, the way to maximize the collection of revenue is by charging people uh, what they can afford to pay. And that's not a unique concept. That's something that I've worked throughout the United States and in, uh, in Canada on. The, the state of Pennsylvania, uh, every energy, every electric and natural gas utility in Pennsylvania offers an income-based uh, percentage of income affordability program. In New Jersey, you're a, a next door neighbor to, uh, to Maryland. Uh, New Jersey's utilities offer percentage of income affordability programs. So the, uh, even the, in Maryland, through the Electric Universal Service Program, uh, there are, there's low income assistance uh, to help make bills uh, more affordable. Ohio, which has had the, uh, the longest running rate affordability program in the nation, uh, Ohio adopted its rate affordability program in the mid-1980s. So the Ohio Percentage of Income Plan has been around for 30 plus years. So 
what we're recommending in, in uh, Baltimore and what we're talking about in Baltimore to make water bills more, afford uh, more affordable isn't new. It's not revolutionary. It is, uh, it's been around not for years, but for decades. It is a demonstrated, uh, a demonstrably effective way to have utility systems be able to generate the funds they need in order to operate uh, their system. Uh, one uh, interesting sideline is Pen both Pennsylvania and Ohio have adopted affordability programs for their natural gas and electric utilities. Uh, their, their water utilities are like Baltimore in that they're, they're not state regulated. Uh, so the, the state programs address natural gas and electricity. And in both of those instances, the utility commission proceeding, uh, at the end of which the states adopted the affordability program, uh, the proceeding was not directed toward helping low-income uh, customers. The proceedings were directed toward helping utilities control their uncollectible expenses. And adopting an affordability program was seen as a strategy to help improve the collection. Uh, so it is, uh, it, it, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that water is a human right, right? Let's all say, it, it, you know, let's all agree on that up front. Water is a human right. Water is a social justice issue. However, water is more, unaffordable water is more than a social justice issue. Uh, unaffordable water is also a business problem for uh, the local utility. It's sort of the, uh, you might remember the adage that uh, if you owe the bank $10,000, you've got a problem. If you owe the bank $10 million, the bank's got a problem. A and that's the, the situation that's facing Baltimore uh, water now. Is that it's not simply the customers that have the problem, it is Baltimore water and its capacity as a utility that has a problem. So I promised a solution. And the solution is to, to adopt an income-based percentage of income uh, program, one such as Delegate Washington uh, uh, has sought to authorize through uh, state legislation. Uh, an income-based program for water companies was actually uh, just recently unanimously adopted by the Philadelphia City Council. And on July 1 of 2017, the City of Philadelphia, uh, the Philadelphia Water Department, began to charge low-income customers uh, affordable rates based on uh, an affordable percentage of income. So what we're asking the City of Baltimore to do is to do nothing more uh, nothing less, but nothing more than what the city of Philadelphia has done, to do nothing less and nothing more than what the state of New Jersey has done, what the state of Pennsylvania has done, what the state of Ohio ha uh, has done, what the state of Colorado uh, has done. This is not an insurmountable problem. This is not an irresolvable problem. What you have, what you, what Baltimore Water has to get over is this notion of hearing low income and hearing the word unaffordability and jumping to the conclusion or the statement, uh, that's a social issue, but you should go uh, to charitable foundations or you should go to the legislature. It is not simply a social issue. It is not uh, simply a, a, a human rights problem. It is a business problem. It's got a business solution and the city of Baltimore could and should be pursuing that business solution. Thank you very much. And if I could just, in, in addition to it being a, a, a business um, problem, I wanted to also add that it's also a billing issue. And I just want, I neglected to share three of the stories. So one of the wonderful things or what I enjoy the most and, and why I am in this in public service is that I have an opportunity to um, I should be uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> um, I don't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no,
live TV. Um, and uh, so I have three stories, and I won't, uh, around how the, both the combination of the billing system doesn't work. So there's a, it's called Miss Johnson. Uh, she made a deal with the city actually to pay off her 215 $216 uh, year uh, water bills, and they were arrears in the amount of like $1,900. And she actually believes that these bills are wrong uh, because she's a single woman um, living alone in her home. So she checked her meter, and she turned off her water, and she came to the conclusion there was no leak. Uh, but the city told her that she could pay $88 a month and that she could ignore the balance. She was told this, we have the emails. They said, ignore the balance as long as you pay the $88 a month. And they told her that this was a, the, the billing plan. When the city changed to the monthly billing, so this is when we were doing the quarterly, but they put her in a monthly payment plan. When the city changed to a monthly billing, she was told she must pay $260 a month towards her 1900 bill, plus her monthly use, usage. And then this amount is a significant burden, of course, uh, for someone on a fixed income. Her last bill was $314, and she paid it with great difficulty, uh, but she had to leave other bills unpaid. So not only do, does not addressing the affordability of a water bill and a, a potential housing issue, it's actually a, an issue for other businesses. In other words, other utilities don't get paid. Other things don't get paid. Um, she told the city that her house would go into tax sale if she did not make the $260 a month monthly usage bills. Uh, Ms. Johnson said that her water bills were just outright wrong. Uh, she does not use that much water, and she knows her families with teenagers who have much lower bills than hers. So we're still working with her uh, in this process. There's a second woman uh, who's elderly. She was having difficulty keeping track of what was going on and communicating with her house and, and difficulty communicating um, with, the, with the city. Uh, there was a $6,000 water bill that was attached to her house. It turned out there was actually a leak, uh, and HomeServe had made some kind of repair. There was no, and again, we have evidence of this. Um, she had made copies of her paperwork. Uh, they said that they would make an adjustment. They made no adjustment. There was no plan offered. Her son repeatedly asked the city to apply the senior discount for the water bill because his mother was a senior. The city did not apply the discount and an investor purchased the house at tax sale because of the unpaid water bill. So we're still hoping to fight that one, but again, this is an, an, an issue, a billing issue as well as a business issue. And then uh, finally, uh, there was a, a, a J Mark and he was behind both on his property tax and water bills. House went to tax sale. The bill was $2,400. Uh, she was able to, uh, they auctioned off her home that she owned right for $2,400. It was sold. There was actually no communication between her and the notice of the tax sale and the auctioning of the house. Somebody just showed up to change the locks and that's how she found out her house was purchased. Uh, she got a letter after the locks were changed and she said she had 30 days to move out. There was never an opportunity for mediation about the water bill. She didn't know that she could make partial payments on the water bill, the property bill, and she felt misinformed. So again, in addition to making sure that Baltimore has an income-based water program, we also have to address this management delivery of how we're billing, uh, this monthly billing system. Uh, that is also the justification for having a moratorium, is that is clearly, it is, it is not being um, administered fairly or properly. And this is just three of the scores of stories um, that have come just to my office uh, in the last year since um, trying, attempting to pass the moratorium. If I can comment on that, and then we want to get to your questions, uh, I believe. But uh, let me just ask folks whether this makes, it, it just whether it makes sense to you on some common sense level. What well, well, we just heard from Delegate Washington, you have a person that has an arrears um, and because they have an unaffordable bill. And the response to that is to increase the bill. Now, on some common sense level, does that make sense to you? That, so uh, that's what we're trying to, uh, uh, to address, that if somebody's behind in their bill because they couldn't afford it in the first place, to respond to it by saying, well, we're going to continue to charge everything that we used to charge you, 
plus a little bit more to have you retire the arrears, that, that, that is bound to fail. And it is failing now, it has failed in other jurisdictions in the country, and that's the, uh, the pro one of, that's the problem that we're trying to address. So, um, do, do you want to take questions? Um, so thank you all for, for coming this evening again. I just wanted to quickly say that we are working, luckily, you know, from Roger's report, from all the work that Delegate Washington has been doing, from experiences like these constituents that she shared, and Pastor James, his church being taken from him, uh, these are the reasons why we are moving forward at the city council level uh, to address this issue, not only at the state level, but also at the city council. We've been working with uh, the council president, Jack Young, to introduce a bill that would not only establish a percentage of income billing, so we can help address some of these issues of unaffordable bills and making sure that water is permanently affordable for all city residents. Uh, another piece of this legislation would include uh, creating an office of the water ombuds, or essentially what this would mean is someone outside of the Department of Public Works who would be able to take a look at the billing complaints and establish payment programs so that cases similar to what Delegate Washington is speaking about uh, will never happen again. Uh, because of course there are issues within the Department of Public Works with the way that they handle some of these, these cases and we want to make sure that everyone has the right uh, to have a case about their water bill and ensure that their, their voice is heard in the process um, and that everyone has due process when it comes to contesting a water bill as well. I'm sure some people have seen the stories about families getting $90,000 water bills or $150,000 water bills and of course these are incorrect and the city should have some way to give families due process and make sure that they're, they're heard as well. So that is the legislation that we are working on at the city level just so that we're all on the same page um, and now we'd love to hear any questions that you all may have for the panelists. So we're actually, I wanted to just let you all know how the next half hour is going to go. Uh, I'm dragging that microphone with this microphone. Uh, okay. Um, so this next half hour, what we're thinking is um, have you all ask some questions of the panelists, and then, um, especially because we're such an intimate crowd, I would love um, for us to talk a bit about where, some, like, for you to tell us who your council people are, we can tell you where they are on this issue and what you should be talking to them about. Um, so stick around. Um, we won't go over time, but we want to be able to do both of those things. So.